In this segment, we're going to talk about positional encodings. These are going to be a key new feature of self-attention, multi-head self-attention, that's going to let us really deliver on what we want these layers to do and let, them let us integrate them into a transformer architecture that's going to work well. So if we're trying to do language modeling and predict what comes next here, we need to look back at the context as we've been discussing. But one kind of key problem that we're, we'll run into if we implement what we've discussed so far is that we don't actually know where this blank is sitting. Remember that we instantiated all these keys, all these queries, but from the perspective of a query on this blank, visited and ate actually look like the same thing, right? Because we have no notion of position in, these, in this model so far. So we're going to use a family of schemes called positional encoding that are going to provide this kind of information to transformers so that they're going to know, oh, OK, you need a word here that is something that you eat rather than something that you visit. All right, so here's the most basic version of this called absolute positional encodings. And it's so kind of, I think it's, it's, it's in some sense almost so simple that it's counterintuitive. What you do is you take the embeddings of each of your words and you add to them a separate embedding of an integer that represents that word's position in the sequence. So if we think about the word embeddings as a big table associating the word the with some vector, movie with some vector, we're going to have another table of independent embeddings that associate the word one with some vector, the word two with some vector. And these are kind of fake words, right? And then we just add these vectors together. This is what's uh, the sort of thing that's stipulated in the attention is all you need paper. You just mix this information into the vectors at the input layer, and then you kind of keep, you do, you do your computation in the rest of your network and you let things attend to each other. And ideally, what the model's gonna learn is that, okay, I need to make embedding one and embedding two sort of drive the model to make these things attend to each other, but maybe embedding one and embedding 50 don't need to care as much about each other's value. So during the learning process, we've kind of given the model enough parameters to say these are the words that should pay attention to each other, and these ones shouldn't. But uh, you know, we've infused this model, this information in, in maybe a very simple way. So there are a few drawbacks of this. I'm going to let you kind of think about those and uh, ask a question after the segment. This is a little bit different than what's stipulated in the Vaswani et al. paper. Uh, but I think it's a lot simpler, and it's also much more standard. For example, like GPT-3 uh, uses the kind of embeddings we just saw. But in the original paper, Vaswani et al. derived this way of producing positional encodings, which are still vectors, that are still going to get mixed in with the words. But they, instead, instead of using parameters, actually use this kind of fixed uh, representation based on sines and cosines of different frequencies. So what we have on the y-axis here are basically the indices of words in the sentence. And then on the x-axis, we have the value for the corresponding embedding dimension. So basically, the first row here is like a vector that's going to be the positional encoding for the first token in, in any sequence that you're given. And this is computed based on the formulas below, which are these uh, kind of crazy sine and cosine formulas that basically uh, kind of move up as you increase the position. And they also uh, depend on the index in the embedding dimension, which is going to basically make it so that uh, some of these embedding dimensions move through the sine and cosine with a at kind of higher period. This is, in some sense, a sort of basis. Like, and what it does is it makes it so that word one and word two are almost identical. They're very, very similar. And only these very high frequency components of the representation are changing. But when you compare word one and word 20, let's say, you could see that the vectors actually look pretty different. And so the, the dot product representations, the dot products of these representations are going to reflect the fact that some of these words like are closer together and then probably should get a higher dot product. 
All right, so that's another way to do it. Uh, it's been a little bit set aside in the literature more recently. I'm just going to mention a couple of uh, more recent variants here uh, of these mechanisms. One is called relative position encoding, uh, which is used in the T5 model that we'll talk about later in the semester, which uh, uses self-attention. And in that computation, it actually injects the uh, position encoding directly into the uh, kind of query times key matrix computation by modeling the distance between any two tokens. So it doesn't uh, capture absolute position, but instead how far apart are these two things. There's also a, a form of this called attention with linear biases, which uh, is also attractive in that it reduces the number of parameters of this uh, kind of dramatically. Rather than trying to model uh, you know, each position as a vector of learnable parameters, instead we just say, all right, we're going to add a single uh, constant m times the distance between the tokens that we're looking at. So it's also a kind of relative position scheme. And this is just going to disprefer attending to things that are farther and farther back. It's kind of pushing down the self-attention weight by m for each token that you go further back in the sequence. And as a kind of key thing here, they take each attention head and they give each attention head in the model a different value of m. So the different heads of self-attention will learn to either prefer things that are closer by or be a little more uniform over the whole sequence. And then finally, uh, in 2023, there was a result looking at just not using positional encodings at all. Now, this is on a slightly modified version of the transformer from what we're seeing so far that only attends to things that are in the past. And this is really important because uh, if you only look at the past, you can sort of learn to count up tokens and figure out where you are organically without having been told that information. If your self-attention mechanism lets you look in both directions, this is totally not going to work. Um, but many of the modern models like ChatGPT do use this causal looking into the past self-attention variant, uh, which we're going to come to a little bit later. And uh, kind of surprisingly, this seems to work OK even without positional encoding. That said, using one of these positional encoding schemes is still quite standard in models today. And it's important to know how to inject this kind of information about position into transformer representations. That's the end of this segment. <laughs>